Hello everyone and welcome to Blank First Page. My name is Lucas. In this video, I'm going to be talking about a system of notebooks which I use to decide which books to read. You'll need a few things. First of all, an everyday carry notebook. Obviously for me, that is my field notes, goes with me everywhere. And you'll also need a long-term reference notebook. This is a notebook that sits on your shelf somewhere, which houses your longer term notes. In this case, we're talking about a list of books to read in the future. I think any big reader has some form of this list. And obviously at blank first page, we're talking about that list within a notebook. So for me, the reference notebook is also a field notes. In fact, it is this particular notebook from the Ambition edition, which is these three notebooks here. This notebook I haven't used yet. It is a make your own calendar kind of notebook. This one is my cooking long-term reference. So this has within it some cooking techniques that I often use, some recipes that I refer back to and so on. This is the one of interest for this video. And this has amongst other things, my ever growing list of books I want to read. And we'll come back to this in a minute. Here are a few other examples of long-term reference notebooks that you could use. A thin hard cover notebook always makes a good one because you're going to be using this for many, many years. So a hard wearing cover is great. Something like this, which isn't the kind of notebook you'd use day to day because it's got these interesting graphs and grids, which aren't super practical for day to day note taking, but it's perfect for opening every so often to write in lists like the one we're going to be talking about today. And obviously you could also go with something classic and reliable like this black hardcover Leuchtturm, which is just a grid line. This one's full, but this kind of notebook has really good paper to write in. It's high quality, going to be durable. Again, something you could use for many, many years, decades potentially. So before we get to any of these notebooks, Obviously we're talking about book recommendations, so you have to have some form of funnel where these book suggestions come through. For me, these suggestions come through a few sources, Twitter, podcasts, uh, recommendations from family and friends, and plain old going into bookstores and just looking at what seems interesting. So whenever I find a suggestion, the first thing I do is write it down in my everyday carry. Once it's noted, that's it, stays in the notebook until the next step. The key thing here is that no matter how many times a book is recommended to you, note it down in your notebook. This whole system relies on a reinforcement of suggestions. So if you're receiving suggestions for the same book from multiple sources, we'll see how that feeds into helping you remember and also eventually buying that particular book. Now here are just a few more examples of the shapes and sizes that the book suggestion note taking can take. This list here is from a bookstore I went into. This one's from a podcast. And this one's just from a conversation with my dad. Now step two is transferring the book suggestion from the EDC to the long-term reference notebook. So when I've filled uh, field notes completely, I go through a process of closing it out that involves going through it page by page, doing a number of different things. And one part of that process is to specifically look for the pages that have a book recommendation on them. When I land on one of those recommendations, I'll look the book up online and check out the table of contents just to see that I am still actually interested in that book. This is kind of the first filter of this whole system. One of the things that can often happen, especially in the case of podcasts, you're listening to this two or three hour long podcast with an author discussing their book. It is a really interesting conversation and you think I'm going to have to read this book. When I later go and look it up again, I often find that interest has worn off. When you're listening to a podcast, you're sort of caught up in the excitement of the podcast. If it's a good interview. But you might also find that when you look at, say, the table of contents, you go, well, the podcast covered the main subject matter of the book. So unless you want to repeat what you've already heard, you can save yourself the time and the expense of buying that book. If after that preliminary research, it's still of interest, then you take it from the EDC and you actually write it down at the bottom of the list. And so you grow your books to read in the future list. The key point here is that the, the long-term list that you've got in your reference notebook is actually a list that you want to go back to. 
If you just have an enormous list of books that you just keep piling in the names into without much thought, the list itself does not have much value. You haven't committed much of your time or effort into curating the list, so it's not going to be something you see as being valuable and it's not going to be something you refer back to. So this first filter, transferring from here to here, it's a physical process, and also having to do some research, puts value into the list you put into the reference notebook. Step three is just to repeat step one and two. You put your recommendations in the notebook, complete your notebooks, transfer them over to the reference list, and you repeat. The main thing is what I mentioned in step one, which is that no matter how many times a suggestion is repeated to you, you put it in your EDC, and if it passes that first filter, it goes again in the long-term list, which means you have duplicate entries in the long-term list. That is a key feature of the system. We'll see why in a minute. Step four, we make a new list. So I typically buy my books in batches of three to five, and when it is time to decide which books to buy, my first point of call is, of course, the long-term list. The first thing I do is I open up to the back of the list and I start scanning backwards and try and find anywhere I have duplicate book recommendations. Anytime I find any, those are the ones that kick off the new list, which is the list of books to buy. If there are any of these duplicate lists, they'll fill out the top few lines of the list, and then I'll start scanning through. There will probably be certain books that I remember my interest in, so they'll go next on the list. And if there's any particular books I don't remember why I noted them down in the first place, I can cross that out on the long-term list, and that way my main list is being maintained. One of the nice things about having a reference notebook like this is that as you are leafing through, you come across a book and you might remember where you were when you took that particular note. So it's kind of like looking back through a photo album, only much more enjoyable because you're looking back through notebooks. Step five is the fun part, which is buying the books. So once I've built up my short list, I might make notes against each line as to how many times that particular book was recommended, why I want to buy that book, good for work, don't know anything about this subject. And then, depending on my budget, I'll decide on, say, the three that I actually want to buy. And that's the process complete. The process is slow and complicated on purpose. There is writing involved. There is having to transfer notes from one place to another. There is research. All of these things that get you to stop and think about what you're doing. You're not allowing yourself to be caught up in the hype of a podcast or sold by an attractive cover. Things that you later regret, both the money that you've spent on a book that you are then not interested in, and also potentially time that you spend trying to get into a book, which would be time better spent reading a book that you could actually learn something new from. For me, I find that once I've started reading a book, even if it's boring, I have a difficult time putting it down. There's this commitment and sunk cost bias that is very difficult to overcome. This process helps you avoid that as much as possible because of all these layers of difficulty a book has to get through to finally make it to your shortlist, you're likely to end up with the books that are most interesting to you and that you're likely going to get something out of once you actually get around to reading them. There's two main vectors under all of this. There's the repetition of the suggestions, you note them down every time you get recommended that book. There's a reinforcing factor, especially if the recommendations are coming from different channels. And also through the process, you've researched that book multiple times. So you've had many opportunities to decide if it is something you're ultimately interested in. If you've got your own versions of these systems, I'd love to hear about them in the comments. And if not, I hope you find this system useful and that you can adopt it for yourself. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.